Right, good morning. Really cool to have you all here. I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, today what we're going to do is start chapter 14, part 1, and in Chem 221 and Chem 222, we have vaguely mentioned acids and bases a little bit, but we haven't gone into a very detailed explanation as to what the heck's going on because we haven't talked about equilibrium. And now, after last Monday, when we talked about equilibrium, we can now really get into what acids and bases are all about and stuff and check it out. We'll talk about pH and jazz like that. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, this Wednesday, as a quick reminder, make sure that you bring the completed identification of an unknown compound lab that we did last week. You'll turn that in right away. Uh, also bring problem set number one, which I hope you at least had a chance to try the problems. We will go over all the problems. You can self-correct, ask questions, just like that before you turn it in. And definitely bring a printed copy of the determination of an equilibrium constant lab, where we're actually going to go into the lab, we're going to make some solutions, and we're going to find the equilibrium constant value, which is kind of cool. Uh, also this week, uh, on Wednesday night, I will release quiz number one. And Friday by 9 o'clock, make sure you turn in quiz number one as a PDF file. So Wednesday, right after my afternoon lab is done, on our website, mhchem.org 223, I will place a link for quiz number one as well as in Discord and stuff like that. And you're responsible for downloading it, completing it, and then you'll email it to me by Friday at 9 o'clock. And also, this Friday at 9 o'clock, if you haven't done so already, pick a class presentation topic. Just about anything in science is fair game this term, which is pretty cool. You do get a couple of points if you reserve your topic by 9 o'clock, all right? If you don't know a topic, you can say, hey, Russell, pick one for me, and I will try to pick one that I find interesting, all right? I prefer that you find something that's interesting to you personally, but I can help you do that too. There's a list of ones on our website that have been claimed already, and some also some suggestions for ones which are still available. Cool. Any questions? Any of that kind of chats? All right. pH and hydromium are related. And in a nutshell, the amount of acid you have is proportional to this H3O+, which is the hydronium ion. So as hydronium ion concentration increases, if you go to the bottom of the top, these numbers are getting bigger, you have more and more acid. But if we're scientists and we're talking to each other about, say, the amount of acid in a tomato, to say, well, it's got you know 3.8 times 10 to the minus 4 molar concentration is kind of wordy and kind of awkward. So scientists have developed um, a pH scale, <clears throat> and pH is a much more efficient way of talking about the amount of acid or base, as we'll see, in a system. So instead of saying that our tomato has some random number of molarity, you can say, well, the pH is 3.7. And when you're used to this, you'll see that pHs that are less than 7 are the acidic pHs, and pHs that are greater than 7, as we'll see, are basic. So on this right-hand side here, you can see some somewhat common things that you might use around you. All right, so besides the tomato, here's coffee. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, urine, don't be playing with that. But anyway, beer, if you're 21 and over, of course, soft drinks, lemon juice, battery acid. But then also down here, things like seawater are actually a little bit basic. Soaps, definitely a little bit basic. Usually ammonia is a cleaner that's used a lot, and it's basic. Oven cleaner, extremely basic. So we'll see how this kind of stuff does apply to our day-to-day -day world, as well as to the world of the chemist and how things go. So if you don't remember basically anything about acids and bases before, that's okay, because we're going to go through all of it now and check it out. Um, the first thing you need to know about acids and bases is that there are strong acids and bases and there are weak acids and bases. So all the acids and bases are split into a couple categories. There's only a couple of common strong acids and strong bases, <clears throat> but there are literally thousands upon thousands of weak acids and weak bases. So we'll make that distinction here in a little bit. Strong acids are strong because they dissociate 100%. 
So in the last section, we talked a lot about equilibrium, where we use double-sided arrows to represent reactants going to products, products going to reactants. When it comes to strong acids and strong bases, we're going to go back to using a single direction arrow. And that just shows that all of the reactants are turned into products. Right? There's no reactants left over. So HNO3, is nitric acid, is considered a strong acid in water. It reacts with water 100%, which is what that arrow means. It turns into hydronium, which I talked about earlier, which is the hallmark of acids, and then a nitrate ion. When a few drops of water are added to solid calcium hydride, a violent reaction occurs that produces hydrogen gas. Strong acids and strong bases, which is really what more this hydride thing is, very active. They'll, they'll do something. They're not just going to sit there, all right? And when you see something happens, that means that there's definitely something pushing to the product side. So the equilibrium systems a lot of times uh, are weaker, like the weak reactants go a little bit to products, but then a lot of them go back to reactants, so it's not quite as impressive. The strong acids and strong bases, on the other hand, Oh boy, they will put on a show for you. They, they will often do something. You'll feel the heat uh, being created if you use them, stuff like that. When nitric acid, HNO3, encounters a water molecule, it forms an acidic solution by donating a proton, the H plus ion, to the water to form a hydronium ion and a nitrate ion. Now in Chem 221, if you remember, acids were always uh, species where the H was listed first. And that just tells the chemist that that H is acidic. So some compounds will have other hydrogens, but only the first ones, and the official way anyway, are the acidic ones. And what happens is that hydrogen goes to water, all right? And it makes the hydronium ion, H3O plus, and as that H plus goes over here, it makes water then have a positive charge, hydronium. And as the HNO3 loses an H plus, it becomes negative. This is the nitrate ion that we've talked about. So forming hydronium like this is a good example of making an acid. And it's an acid because of the hydronium. The hydronium is literally kind of what makes an acid an acid. Now, as I said earlier, there's only a couple of strong acids and a couple of strong bases that are strong, at least common ones. And in this class, it's gonna be super important that you know the five common strong acids. And those are nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, and this is perchloric acid. Those five acids are going to be things that you want to know uh, what's going on. There's going to be literally thousands of weak acids, all right? But there's only going to be, for us anyway, five strong acids. So if you see an acid that's not on this list and I don't say anything, then probably it's going to be a weak acid, and that's really helpful. Now in the real world, there are a couple of other strong acids, definitely, but they're rare, all right? They're not very common. But these five uh, will pop up quite a bit. And again, all of them, what it means is that you have, you're going to use a one-sided arrow, the individual version, and the acidic hydrogen goes to water to make hydronium and chloride. So this is for HCl. If this would have been perchloric acid, you would have ended up with hydronium as well, and then ClO4 minus the perchlorate ion would be left. I don't know who has this car, but it's the coolest car license plate ever. HCL, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I've never seen an HBR, but if you happen to see a license plate with one of these things, send me a picture. Anyway, one of my students sent me this and I was, I was dying. But anyway, okay, I'm kind of a dork for acids and bases, I'll be totally honest. Moving on. Questions on strong acids I should have asked. Good. Anyway, all the other acids, for us anyway, all right, unless I tell you differently, are considered weak acids. And weak acid just means that it's not going to be totally one directional. We're back to equilibrium, all right? So acetic acid is an acid we've been dancing around since Chem 221 as well. Sometimes the H that's acidic is at the end, sometimes it's at the beginning. It's a real nightmare compound to teach about, I'll be honest. 
Um, we're going to use acetic acid a lot in our upcoming conversations. And sometimes the acetate ion is OAC minus. That's a common representation. So instead of writing CH3CH2H, you can just write HOAC, and that's a common way to do it. So I'm introducing it here. So acetic acid, a weak acid, also reacts with water. As an acid, it also makes hydronium, and the H plus, when it goes away, makes acetate. But the difference here is that this now is an equilibrium, all right? And they feel that about one of every 10,000 acetic acids goes to hydronium, but the ones that do go to hydronium oftentimes will go back with an acetate ion and reform acetic acid. This is the Lewis structure for acetic acid. This is the acidic hydrogen. When it pops off and you have a negative charge right there, this is a resonance stabilized charge. So it's a somewhat stable ion when it forms, but it's also happy to take that H plus back from hydronium uh, and make acetic acid again. So just realize that if you see HOAC in the future, it will mean acetic acid. If you forget, definitely ask, all right? But it is a common representation for uh, acetate and acetic acid. So most acids that we'll talk about are going to be weak and that just means we use the equilibrium double-sided arrow, all right? If it happens to be one of those five strong acids, one-sided arrows, we don't have to worry about equilibrium. Any questions on that? Now, bases are the same kind of game. They're strong and weak acids and bases. And there's only a couple of strong bases. But like the strong acids, if you have a strong base, it just means it dissociates 100% in water. So that, what that means in practical world, we're going to use a single arrow. So NaOH breaks down to Na plus and OH minus, and that's one way. All right, there's no going back to the NaOH. There's only three strong monobasic bases. We'll talk about what that means too, but the three are NaOH, KOH, and LiOH. Potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, and lithium hydroxide. And unless I say anything differently, all the other bases will, you will consider weak. And again, weak just means you'd use an equilibrium symbol right there instead of the single one. Um, there are other strong bases. Um, notice how on the previous ones I said monobase. Monobase just means one hydroxide, all right? So NaOH, KOH, and LiOH give one OH minus. Calcium hydroxide is considered a dibasic system, and that means two hydroxides. That's all that means. Calcium hydroxide is a strong base, but it's not one that's used quite as often. Um, calcium hydroxide is sometimes called slate lime, and it comes from calcium oxide, which is lime. So those are the common names for these things, uh, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the important part for you for now is that there's going to be three strong bases that I want you to know. All right, KOH, LiOH, NaOH. So things like calcium hydroxide and other strong bases, I would say they're strong bases. But again, all of these are strong, and we're going to use the single arrow, not the equilibrium arrow, to represent them. Any questions on that? So just like there are thousands of weak acids and only a couple of strong acids, there are also thousands of weak bases and only a couple of strong bases. So most of the bases that we deal with will be weak, all right, and again, if it's not NaOH, LaOH, or, or potassium hydroxide, uh, then you're going to assume it's base and it's weak. Ammonia is the classic weak base. It's one we've talked about a lot and we'll use a lot in the system. And again, weak just means you want to use equilibrium. Ammonia acts as a base in solution by accepting a proton from a water molecule. This liberates a hydroxide ion and results in a basic solution. So what happens in solution is ammonia also reacts with water, but instead of giving up an H+, ammonia is much more likely to pull an H+, from water. And in the process, you make ammonium, as it pulls the H+, from water, it becomes positive, and water without the H+, becomes hydroxide. So just like hydronium was the hallmark of an acid, hydroxide is the hallmark of a base. 
But weak bases, if the ammonium hydroxide forms, they will sometimes go back and reform ammonium water. So that's why we're using an equilibrium symbol for these weak bases. If it was sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide would go 100%, i.e. single arrow, to Na plus plus OH minus. But ammonia or all the other, other bases we'll see, they'll react with water to make hydroxide and something else, but some of those products will go back to reactants. So, so strong acids, weak acids, strong bases, weak bases. We use equilibrium when it comes to weak acids and weak bases, but not strong acids and strong bases. Any questions on that? Sweet. So, <clears throat> there are several acid-base theories. There's actually three that are used a lot, and we're going to use two of them quite a bit in this class. And the one we'll use the most is called the Bronsted-Lowry theory. Now, Bronsted and Larry both came up with this idea. Bronsted is the one that usually gets credit for it. I think chemists like using Bronsted because it's got that cool O with the slash throw, but anyway, I digress. So Lowry is part of this officially, but usually they just call it Bronsted uh, system. And this is the most common of the acid-base theories. In a Bronsted-Lowry theory, all right, acids donate H plus ion and bases accept H plus ions, all right? So acids give up the H plus, bases accept the H plus. And that'll be the way that we can define what an acid and base is. There's a handout about it if you're curious, but let's look at some examples of how Brown's dead acid base theory works. Now remembering that bases accept an H plus, and acids give up an H plus. Let's go back and look at this ammonia plus water example. Now I said earlier that ammonia is a base. Let's explore now in Bronsted theory like what that means. Ammonia acts as a base in solution by accepting a proton from a water molecule. This liberates a hydroxide ion and results in a basic solution. So in Bronsted theory then, the acids give up an H plus. So water is giving one of its H pluses to ammonium. And you can see at the end then, you end up with hydroxide. Bases accept the H plus from the acid. So you can see the ammonia takes the H plus from, F, from H2O and makes ammonia, all right? So this is how Bronsted-Lowry theory works. Bases accept an H plus, acids give up an H plus. However, because this is an equilibrium, you can do the same kind of analysis on the products going to reactants. So let's pretend that we have ammonium and hydroxide and we want to figure out what the acid and the base is. Well, the acid gives up an H plus to become less H plus ammonia and that H plus has to go somewhere. So the base hydroxide accepts the H plus to make water. So notice here how a base and an acid made an acid and a base, all right? And because it's equilibrium, they're going back and forth. But also what's really interesting is that the base ammonia creates an acid ammonium. And the acid water creates a base hydroxide, and vice versa, the base hydroxide creates an acid water, and the acid ammonium creates a base ammonia. So these things go back and forth. Acids basically are turning themselves into bases, and bases are essentially turning themselves into acids. And because it's equilibrium, you can go back and forth like that. Okay, so ammonia is a base, and in this context with ammonia, water is acting as an acid. Water is giving up an H+, so the base is accepting that H+, it becomes an acid over here, and water, the acid, becomes hydroxide, which is the classic base. So we're going to start talking about what's called a conjugate pair, and a conjugate pair is just two chemicals with either, a, either an extra H plus or a less than H plus between them. So for example, ammonia and ammonium are conjugates. 
If you add an H plus to ammonium, you make ammonium. If you take away an H plus from ammonium, you make ammonia. Conjugate pair is literally two chemicals related by an H plus. Water and hydroxide are also conjugate pairs. Excuse me. If you take away an H plus from water, you have hydroxide. But if you add that hydroxide back to the back there, it makes water again. So these reactions have two conjugate pairs. One's an acid, one's a base. If you can't remember which is an acid and a base, the one with more hydrogens is the acid. So if you're looking at this, you're like, water, hydroxide, which is which? Well, water has more H, hydroxide has less H. That means water is the acid and hydroxide is the base. Any questions? Water is a kind of a player unto itself. Now here's another example. This is a hydrogen carbonate ion, HCO3 minus. And again, notice how that H is listed first, so that means it has some acidic properties. Hydrogen carbonate reacts with water. Because it's an acid, it gives up the H plus here and makes carbonate. So hydrogen carbonate and carbonate are conjugate pairs. This is the acid. It has more H plus than carbonate, the base. But water here is acting like a base. So water here is actually accepting the H plus from hydrogen carbonate to make hydronium. So in the last example with ammonia, water was the acid, but here water is the base. So you can see here that water sometimes is acidic and sometimes it's basic. In this example, it's a base, but with ammonia, it was an acid. Water is very, very flexible and it depends what else it's with to define uh, how these things are going to go. So the question here then is which of the following is not an acid-base conjugate pair? And what you want to do here is, first of all, two things. The acid and the base conjugate pair have to be related by an H+. Plus, all right? So for example, uh, this one here, it would not be a good example of that because this one is, doesn't have an H+, plus, it's true, but it also doesn't have an oxygen. So this is not a conjugate pair, all right? You don't have an H plus, plus or minus. Now, of the other ones down here, all right, these uh, are all conjugate pairs, like HF minus an H plus is F minus, and F minus plus, plus an H plus is HF. And same thing down here, here's nitric acid. If you take away an H plus, it's NO3, and NO3 minus plus the H plus is that one. So the only one that's not a conjugate pair is that first one. Conjugates literally just have plus or minus an H plus. All right, you're not gonna have anything else going on. And there's an oxygen here that this one doesn't. If this would have been ClO minus, and this would have been HClO, then it would have been a conjugate pair. Or if this would have been HCl and Cl minus, but not as it is. Any questions? Without the addition of any other substances, two water molecules can interact with each other to produce a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion by transfer of a proton from one water molecule to another. This process is called autoionization. In these courses so far, we've seen how water has real special properties. So, for example, we saw it has a high heat capacity. The 4.184 number is actually really high for most substances. Uh, we also saw how water undergoes hydrogen bonding in Chem 222. So water has much higher boiling points and stuff than other things. Um, one more thing that's really unique about water is that it undergoes what's called autoionization. And autoionization is just the fact that water can be both an acid and a base. So if you have two waters next to each other, one of them will take an H plus and take it unto itself, and you'll end up with a hydronium and a hydroxide. Autoionization just means that some of the water breaks down into hydronium and 
hydroxide, it auto-ionizes. It becomes, goes from neutral H2O into things with ions, H3O plus and hydroxide. Not a lot of compounds do this, and this is one of the things that makes water really unique. And what that also means then is that any sample of water, you're going to have some hydronium and some hydroxide at the same time. Not very much, but you will have a little bit. And this is again just due to water's ability to act as both an acid and a base, and not very many compounds do this, that's for sure. Scientists have studied this reaction a lot, and they found an equilibrium constant. Now the reaction that you would look for would be two waters, which are liquid at 25 degrees Celsius, and that goes to hydroxide times hydronium. So if you wrote this out, you would say two H2O liquid in equilibrium with hydronium and hydroxide. They give this equilibrium constant a special symbol, it's Kw, and it's equal to the hydronium concentration times the hydroxide concentration. Why are the waters not in the Kw expression? What, uh, what parts of a chemical reaction do you not put in an equilibrium constant? Liquids, that's right. Liquids and solids, that's right. So the waters that are liquids here aren't part of the equilibrium expression. We would just like divide by one here, basically. So Kw here for this reaction equals hydronium times hydroxide. And the equilibrium value, the K value they find, 10 to the minus 14 at room temperature. 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14. This K is much, much, much less than one. So does that mean for this reaction that we have more reactant, water as a liquid, or more product, more hydronium and hydroxide? More reactant. More reactant, well done. Anytime K is less than one, and this number is much, much less than one, you're gonna have much more reactant than you have product. So at any given time, you're gonna have a lot more liquid water than you're gonna have hydronium and hydroxide. Now, if you think about this a little bit further, the water, all right, that we all consume day to day, whether it's in <laughs> caffeine or pure water or, you know, IPAs, whatever, just, I just say no kids, whatever kind of things you drink, all the water is in equilibrium, and all the water is gonna make a little hydronium and a little hydroxide. How much hydronium and hydroxide? This is acids and bases. Well, people have figured this out. If hydronium and hydroxide are the only products, then as water breaks down, say if two water molecules break down, you'll have one hydronium and one hydroxide. Oops, I reversed that, sorry. So what that means is that for every X hydroxides you're gonna have, you're gonna have X hydronium. So hydronium and hydroxide in this reaction are equal to each other. As water breaks down, you'll have equal amounts of hydroxide and hydronium. So Kw equals hydronium times hydroxide, but because they're the same, it's like hydronium squared or hydroxide squared or X squared. And if you want to figure out how much hydronium and hydroxide you have, take the square root of both sides. The square root of 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14 is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7. So as you take a nice, relaxing sip of water, <laughs> all right, oh my gosh, you're drinking hydronium concentrations, 10 to the minus 7, and basic concentrations, 10 to the minus 7 molar. Now normally, uh, some of it, I think we talked about it a little bit last week in lab, if you drink acid and base, it's not a good thing. However, 10 to the minus seventh molar, is that a big number or a small number? Very small. Very small, that's right. So as you drink whatever drink you have, all right, you are drinking a little bit of acid and a little bit of base. 
but it's very, very small. 10 to the minus seventh moles per liter is not a big number. Our bodies are naturally used to drinking that much acid and base at any one time. But it is an important thing to think about because as you drink water or coffee or pop or fill in the blank, you are consuming a little bit of acid and base. Now, KW is going to be a number we're going to use a lot in the next several chapters. And I'd like you to know slash memorize slash put your calculators and don't get a tattoo, but anything. Whatever you want to do, but have this number ready, all right? We're going to use it. If you go on to a medical field where you're talking about things in the human body, some of the KW things may or may not work as well as I'd like them to because the human body is 98.6 Fahrenheit, about 37, I think, Celsius. And that's a little different than what we're going to be quoting in the next several chapters. We're talking about room, room temperature kind of things. In a medical field, which is a little bit warmer temperature in the body, some of the things we talk about, which are based on KW, may not work as well as I'd like them to. So just FYI on that. That's one of the limitations of this section. But if you see what we can do with this version of KW, you could actually calculate your own KW value and go crazy with it. So we'll talk more about that later. Uh, any questions? Okay, so Kw, this number, equals hydronium times hydroxide. And that's also really cool because we can start playing with hydroxide or hydronium and see kind of what's left. So as an example of this, let's say that we have a solution of hydronium, H3O+, plus, which is 10 to the minus 8, all right? What's the concentration of hydroxide? What you can do is go back to this KW value, 1.00, 10 to the minus 14. And it says hydronium is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8. We can solve here for hydroxide. So in this problem, hydro KW is a constant, assuming we're at room temperature. This is the amount of hydronium we have, so you can solve here for hydroxide. It's like 10 to the minus 14 divided by 10 to the minus 8. And with exponents, minus 8 at the bottom becomes positive 8 on the top, blah, blah, blah. It comes out to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6. You can do that in your calculator, or you can nerd out like I just did with exponents. Either way is fine. But the cool thing is, is that you can calculate then hydronium or hydroxide if you know the other, and you know that Kw value. So KW is going to be pretty cool for the kind of stuff we're going to talk about. Any questions? Sweet. All right, so here's a problem you might see. We're going to use that hydroxide times hydronium equals KW expression in this problem too. In this problem though, instead of having pure water, we're going to add a little bit of sodium hydroxide. You know, if you've ever used Drano on a clogged pipe, Drano is essentially the crystals, those are essentially sodium hydroxide crystals, real, real strong base. And you know it's a base because NaOH is one of those three strong bases that I want you to know. So in this question, we want to find the hydronium and the hydroxide after adding 0 0.0010 moles sodium hydroxide to a liter of pure water. So to do this kind of problem, we'll start with the KW expression once again. Two waters in equilibrium with hydronium and hydroxide. Now, Le Chatelier's principle is something we talked about at the end of chapter 13 last week. And Le Chatelier's principle was basically if you add something, the reaction tries to adjust to get away from what you're adding. In this problem, we're adding hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. And if you start adding hydroxide, which is a product in this reaction, does that mean that this reaction is going to be shifting to the left side, the reactant side? Will it shift to the right side, the product side? Or will it just stay the same? What do you think? To the left. Absolutely. Well done. It's going to shift to the left. You start adding a product the reaction's going to shift away from what you add. It's going to shift to the reactant side. So in this problem, we predict 
that this reaction is going to shift to the left, to the reactant side. Hydronium was 10 to the minus 7th in a neutral solution. When we took the square root of Kw, that's the value, that's the neutral value. By knowing that this reaction shifting to the left, your hydronium is going to be less than 10 to the minus 7. Hydroxide is going to be blasted out here as we add this in, but hydronium is actually going to go down in the process. So check it out how we use Le Chatelier's principle to make a prediction anyway as to what approximately the hydronium is going to be. It was neutral solution was 10 to the minus 7th moles per liter. We will expect a concentration less than 10 to the minus 7th. Oh, Russell, you hand wave so much. Okay, I totally understand. Let's set up the ice table. Woohoo! An ice table again, initial change and equilibrium. Now, water is a liquid. We throw that out. We don't need that. Now, initially, let's pretend we don't have any added hydronium, but the hydroxide, 0 0.0010 divided by 1 liter, is 0 0.0010 moles per liter. Now, as Kw kicks in, some hydronium and some hydroxide will be made. So the change part here would be like plus x, and then at equilibrium, you'd have x for hydronium and 0 0.0010 plus x for hydroxide. And again, this expression we're using here, that's the Kw expression we talked about, the 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. So if these are the values at equilibrium, then we can set up Kw equal to x times 0 0.0010 plus x. And again, Kw is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14. Now, at this point, all right, if we used what we talked about in the last section, you'd multiply x by both of those, you'd have x squared plus 0 0.0010x, and if you put kw on the other side, you'd have minus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. That would be a quadratic formula. You could set up, if you've got that cool solve button on your calculator, you could set it up that way. However, in this section, I'm going to do a lot of things to try and hopefully keep you from doing quadratic expressions. There's nothing wrong if you want to do quadratic expressions all the time, and some people really like it. So, Alfonso, if you like doing quadratics, you do it, man. No problem at all. However, lazy chemist, in our example here, x was the 10 to the minus 7th moles per liter when it was neutral solution, all right? And Le Chatelier's principle said, as we move the reaction to the left, we add hydroxide, it's gonna move the reaction to the left. What was 10 to the minus seventh before is gonna be even smaller now as you add hydroxide. So what this means is because X is so much less than 10 to the minus three, it's like 10 to the minus 3 plus 10 to the minus 9. And by sig figs, which I know are those hated things that everybody, ugh, but by sig figs, this x isn't going to make any difference to your number. We did a problem last week in Wednesday where it was like 10,000 minus 1 or 1,000 minus 1. And we talked about how it still is equal to 1,000 or 10,000, whatever number I use. Same thing here. 10 to the minus 3, which is what this number is right now, plus 10 to the minus 7, which was the neutral, is still 10 to the minus 3. And x is going to be even smaller than that. So what this means, we are absolutely justified in pulling out this plus x. And that will keep us from doing the quadratic. Now, Alfonso says, man, I really want to do it, Russell. Go for it. It's not a problem. <laughs> don't trust anyone over 40, and I don't know why I'm talking about that. But anyway, if you don't believe me, go through the quadratic, man. It's no problem. But I promise, pulling out this plus x is okay, because 10 to the minus 3 plus a number much less than 10 to the minus 7 is still going to be equal to this one right here. Questions? Okay. 
So if you can assume hydroxide is literally equal to 10 to the minus 3, this problem is a heck of a lot easier. Instead of having x times 0 0.001 plus x, we can just pull out this plus x and say it's x times 0 0.0010. And remember, x is the hydronium in this problem right here. It's the, it was the value of hydroxide too, but this x is so small here, we're just going to pull this out. So we're going to solve directly for hydronium here. We know Kw, 10 to the minus 14. This is our unknown, and this is the hydroxide, 0 0.0010. So, 10 to the minus 14, Kw, divided by 0 0.0010, value 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11 molar. And at this point, you should go back and double check that your instructor isn't just full of strawberries here. Because I said 10 to the minus 3, which is this number, plus x was going to be basically equal to 10 to the minus 3. Well, 10 to the minus 3 plus 10 to the minus 11th, oh yeah, that's still 10 to the minus 3. By sig figs, as you add, you cut it off at the doubtful digit. This zero right there is a doubtful digit. This one doesn't begin until many, 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 many numbers to the right of the decimal line. So hydronium here, 10 to the minus 11 moles per liter. All right, any questions on that? So in this problem, this is something we'll talk about. This little plus x, if we include it, would make it a quadratic. But sometimes you're totally legit pulling it out because x plus a bigger number is basically still equal to the bigger number. And that'll be helpful to us as we go through these. Okay. So, hydronium, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11, all right, which is a very, very small number. You add hydroxide, hydronium goes down. And that's what equilibrium is all about here. Le Chatelier said you add hydroxide, it moves it to the left, so hydronium goes down quite a bit, and it certainly did. So we would say that this solution is basic, all right? And it's basic because we have more hydroxide, 0 0.0010, than we have hydronium, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. So basic just means more hydroxide, hydronium, uh, or more hydroxide, acidic means more hydronium. But man, talking about 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11th versus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3, snoozeville. So instead of doing all of these times 10 to the, that's where the pH factor comes in. This is from some cheesy animation CD-ROM thing, I guess, that used to come out. But anyway, this pH thing is going to be an easier way that we can talk about acid and base strength without doing it. But I do want to point out how because the hydroxide is greater than the the hydronium number, that's why this is a basic solution and not acidic. If this number, the hydronium, would have been a bigger number than the basic hydroxide, then we would have had an acidic solution. Okay, so this guy named Sorensen thought, you know, that really sucks to talk about 10 to the minus whatever all the time. And Sorensen had O's with the circles to him in both his first and last name, so he's obviously a cool person. No, I'm just joking. Anyway, pH scale stands apparently for the potential of hydrogen. Whatever. He defined pH as pH equals minus log of the hydronium concentration. All right, that's where I uh, came in. This is what people use all over the world now to talk about amounts of acid and base. In a neutral solution, if we drink a glass of water, hydronium and hydroxide, as we saw earlier, are both equal to 1.00 times 10 to the minus seven. So if you look at the pH of a neutral solution, you would look at the pH of hydronium, which is 1.0 times 10 to the minus seven. Now, this is a base 10 log, L-O-G. Do not use the L-N log. However, if you have to do base 10 log, for example, log x, you can go natural log of x divided by natural log of 10. So if you have a calculator with L-O-G on it, this is going to be an advantage in this section, absolutely. 
That being said, if you only have it calculated with LN, you can do LOGs. And sometimes you can go through the catalog and search and find a hot button, whatever. But you can also do it this way too. But make sure you use base 10 logs, not natural logs. So for pure water, pH comes out to be 7. So a neutral solution of water, or for anything, first of all, has a value of 7. And what that means is that hydronium and hydroxide concentrations are the same. So we'll talk about a pH of 7 as being neutral, all right? That just means it's not acid or base free. It means that acid and base are equal to each other at a very low concentration. This is what we drink, so FYI. Questions? Okay. Um, so here's a question. Earlier we looked, went through the calculations and for a 0 0.0010 molar sodium hydroxide solution, what's the pH of that solution? So we would look at the hydronium, the H3O plus concentration, and we saw after my quick and dirty kind of cutting the X out thing, that hydronium was 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. So pH equals minus log of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. That's 11.00. So your pH of that solution is 11.00. So in the pH scale, bases have pHs larger than 7, like this one right here. There's more base than acid. It was 10 to the minus 3, which was greater than this 10 to the minus 11, so we said it was basic. Well, now we see right away that, hey, base is pH of 11. That's always going to be basic. Neutral solutions, pH are equal to 7, or pretty close, depending on what you're doing. And acids have pHs less than 7. So just realize that even though this is an acid scale, more acid means small pH. And more base, as it turns out, means high pH. PH, which is a little bit backwards, but once you get used to it, it's pretty chill. Now, if nothing else, after this, you should know that public enemy are not scientists. <laughs> yeah. How low can you go? Uh, bases are fire. Anyway, Chuck, Chuck D, a public enemy, actually has an BA, which is an excellent degree unto itself, but he's obviously not a scientist. And uh, Flavor Flav, it was in the Flavor of Love on VH1, well, I'm not even going to go there where he is, but anyway, just really, you know, the poor Republican enemy doesn't do a good job in terms of acids and bases. Put the big L loser on my face. Anyway, just realize, yeah, bases, actually, pHs are higher. How high can you go? All right, really dumb, I know. Acids, uh, low pH, bases, high pH, pH of 7, neutral. Questions? If I have a solution with a pH of 10.5, it could be lame, but that's not the correct answer here. Do you think that pH of 10.5 means acidic, basic, or neutral? What do you think? Basic. basic, that's right. Base, how high can you go, not low can you go. Again, look at literally that number for quickly determining if something is acidic or basic. No problem. Any questions? Diet Coke actually uh, is a little bit acidic. Most of the things we eat and drink are actually acidic. So if you, this is an example of a pH meter. We'll use these in lab here coming up, some version of it. Anyway, you put a little probe in the Diet Coke and out comes the pH value 3.12. So if the pH is 3.12, that's less than seven. Does that mean that Diet Coke is acidic, basic, or neutral? Acidic, absolutely. Anytime you have a pH less than 7, it's acidic. Now, let's say we wanted to know how acidic it was, how much hydronium there was. No problem. pH equals minus log of hydronium. So we want to solve for hydronium. Now, to get rid of the LOG, you take the anti-base 10 log, which is 10 to the x on your calculator. And you can literally put in 10, the little caret symbol, and whatever the number is. You do put a negative in there just to make sure that happens. So in this side, <clears throat> first you want to put the negative on the other side. So minus pH equals log hydronium. And again, to get rid of this log, that's where the 10 to the x button comes in. 
So hydronium, in this case, is 10 raised to the power of minus 3.12. So on your calculator, this is a cool thing to do, 10 carat minus 3.12, or 10 to the x, and then you put in minus 3.12 you should get 7.6 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter. This number is greater than 10 to the minus 7 molar, which is the neutral version, so that's another way to confirm that it's an acidic value. Any questions on that? I'm kind of curious how you would, like, what the science is behind a pH meter. How do you detect the acidity in a, a solution? Um, physicists and engineers are really good at finding uh, conductance, which is in a chemical level, like when you have more or less H pluses on one side versus the other. All right, this is a really dumb level because I may not be the best person here, Julian, to talk about it. But um, more acid it just means that you have uh, more H plus. So you have like a stronger voltage difference, basically. All right. And um, you can have probes, for example, that measure the hydroxides more than the H pluses. And as you had more hydroxides, more bases, you would have also a different potential. But it's basically a difference in voltage, yeah. And um, in, uh, there's a class in chemistry, uh, instrumental analysis, and they go into that a lot more than I've done. But that's kind of like a, a very basic example of why it works and stuff, yeah. It's really cool in a nutshell, so <laughs> good, very good question. Very cool question. Other questions? Didn't they, didn't they like take Diet Coke and then put, like, put a dead rat in it? And then like, they, put, they left it in there for a couple months, and when they came back, it was just bone? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, the uh, Cokes and uh, products and Pepsis and stuff like that too, they have a lot of acid in it. So yeah, it will absolutely eat through uh, stuff like that. You can find really cool forensic stories of crime, uh, how people are putting you know, people with nitric acid vats and stuff like that, right? And it's gruesome, but it, it's pretty cool science on the other hand, too, so. I don't know why that was the first thing I thought of. Uh, <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay, I love it, man. Um, moderation and everything is probably a good call, whether it's, you know, IPA or caffeine-based uh, substitutes and stuff, you know, just little bits, but yeah, you did have to decide for yourself what you find is a safe, level and things that are acceptable versus not acceptable, so yeah. Okay, bad formatting, sorry about that. Uh, we have a solution there with a pH of 4.50, sorry it's being uh, overrun there, and you want to calculate the hydronium concentration, so what you would do in this problem, 10 raised to the power of minus 4.50, sorry it's not very easy to see there, but anyway, if you do this, it comes out to be 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Any questions on that? All right, let's take a break. Um, I'll fix this slide here for my own notes real fast. Um, it's about 9.53. We'll meet back here at 9.58.